Yeah, Alimada. Welcome to our discussion this evening. My name is Marila Ali, and I'm honored to be the moderator for today's webinar on managing conflicts and disputes in contracts. This is the third webinar in a four-part series on understanding the psychology of contracts in business, where we will explore the role of each party in each contracts and agreements, defining the key techniques of dispute resolution, namely negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. And finally, creating proper exit strategies in contracts. All discussions during the course of this webinar are the views and opinions of the speakers themselves and do not necessarily reflect the views of their employers or affiliates. The information provided does not constitute financial, legal, tax, or investment recommendations or advice. We are privileged to have joining with us today two panelists highly respected in the field of mediation and arbitration. Rahim Mulu is a partner in the New York office of Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher. He has been recognized as a leader in the field of international arbitration. Mr. Mulu's practice focuses on assisting clients to resolve complex international disputes. Concurrently, Mr. Mulu is an adjunct professor at Columbia Law School where he teaches an advanced course on international arbitration and serves on several boards, including the International Conciliation and Arbitration Board, the Alumni Board of Directors for the University of British Columbia. Raheem previously worked with the AKDN as general counsel for the University of Central Asia. Mr. Malou has lectured at leading law schools and conferences and published several articles on international arbitration and litigation, international investment law, and public international law, many of which have been cited in international arbitration decisions, courts around the world, and leading treatises. Jeanette Barjot is a renowned chartered mediator with many years of experience working within the Canadian federal, provincial, and municipal governments, along with private and nonprofit organizations. Her expertise is in the field of workplace mediation and conflict resolution through coaching, facilitated discussions, group intervention, mediation, and training. Jeanette also has her own practice, Pinnacle Mediation, where she consults with corporate entities in the field of workplace mediation, conflict resolution, skills development through coaching and workshops. The topic of today's discussions are negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. Negotiation is a discussion or dialogue between two or more individuals aimed at reaching a mutually beneficial agreement. It is a method by which people settle differences. It is a process by which compromise or agreement is reached in an effort to avoid dispute. In any disagreement, including contract disputes, Individuals aim to look out for themselves and achieve the best possible outcome for their own position, or perhaps that of their organization, often to the detriment of others. However, effective negotiation looks to find common ground so that a settlement can be reached that is sustainable for all parties. The goal is to find a win-win resolution. Negotiation may proceed and is certainly part of other types of alternative dispute resolutions. Alternative dispute resolutions, also referred to as ADR, is a spectrum of less costly and more expeditious alternatives to litigation where a neutral party assists the disputing parties in reaching resolution. ADR allows for more creative and collaborative solutions than that of traditional litigation. Mediation, is a form of alternative dispute resolution. It is a voluntary process whereby two or more parties attend a meeting in an effort to reach a mutually agreeable resolution. The parties meet with a mediator who must be neutral and whose purpose is to facilitate the discussion and assist the parties come to a resolution. 
Arbitration is another form of alternative dispute resolution, whereby two or more parties submit their disputes for binding resolution by a private decision maker. The decision is binding and may be converted to a judgment by the courts. With that, I will now invite Jeanette to speak on the topic of mediation. Thank you for the great intro. So the area that I work in currently and um, my areas of expertise lie in is the mediation. Um, so today, again, I'm just going to reiterate that mediation is a confidential, voluntary process. It's a process that you have a neutral facilitator, somebody who is unbiased. They're not there to say who's right or wrong. <clears throat> they're not there to review your documentation. And they're not there to provide you with the solution. The role of a mediator is to provide an environment that the participants can come together, build an understanding, and then go forward to look for a resolution that's beneficial to both parties. So what are the designations currently in Canada for a mediator? The first one is a certified mediator. That rule shows that they've taken certain level of courses specific courses under the mediation profession. The qualified mediator shows that they've taken more education, but also have some workplace or real life experience. As a chartered mediator, you have to go through an assessment with our federal governing body. And it includes, again, education, work experience, and also it starts to bring in some teaching and coaching aspects of the mediation field. So currently in Canada, we have the overarching governing body is the Alternative Dispute Resolution Institute of Canada, so ADRIAC. And then in every province, they have the provincial legislation and it kind of governs um, the learning paths. It puts together monthly meetings. It puts out newsletters. It keeps everybody within the province in line with what the federal government uh, governing body is putting down. So why choose mediation? Well, as they said, negotiation gives you and leaves you the most amount of decision-making power in your hands, and mediation does the same. The outcome is driven by the participants only. Nobody is there to tell you, you have to do it this way, or here's what you have to take forward. It is the participants themselves that decide. Now, as you go up the conflict resolution spectrum, and you start getting into arbitration and litigation, you start to lose the ability to have an input as to what's going to happen in the end. So what else we look at is that's the control factor. And what about the time that it takes? Well, between negotiation and mediation, you're probably sitting, it could take the same amount of time Mediation may take a bit longer just because you're involving the third party and they have to prep and do all the pre-mediation calls. So as you look at the time that you would spend, negotiation is fairly quick. Mediation hits the next level. But as you go into arbitration and litigation, the amount of time that it takes to process a case until you've got an end result, all escalate. And then the cost follow that same time escalation. So negotiation and mediation, it's going to be minimal amount of cost as compared to arbitration and litigation. So again, just showing the benefits of choosing mediation or negotiation at the very um, onset of the conflict gives you the most advantages in the resolution portion. So here I've just listed it a little bit differently than on a graph. 
So negotiations, the control is with the participants, cost is minimal, and the time can be dealt with in a short turnaround time. Looking at mediation, again, the outcome stays with the participants. The cost is usually between 1,500 and 3,000, and the time it takes is between 10 and 20 hours. So when we start moving up to arbitration, you start to release the control of the outcome to another party, the costs start to escalate, and so does the time. So within the Islamic Muslim community, um, they have an organization and it's called the Conciliation and Arbitration Board, CAB for short. So throughout history, the Shia Islam Muslim community has maintained a tradition of resolving disputes and differences through a voluntary process of mediation, conciliation, and arbitration. The CAB board system in 1986, His Highness the Aga Khan established a global institute framework for the Conciliation Arbitration Board to provide dispute resolution services for all Ismailis at the regional, national, and international level. So what is the vision? The vision is to be the first choice in dispute resolution for all Ismaili Muslims through the provision of best-in-class alternative dispute resolution services and the promotion of using dispute resolution. What is their mission? is to provide the leading edge dispute resolution services for the global Islamic Muslim community through highly trained and committed volunteers and to promote dispute resolution through sister institutes. There'll be more on the core values later in the presentation. So what is the mandate for the Conciliation and Arbitration Board? Is to assist the parties with differences and disputes arising from various types of dispute. So they've got commercial, matrimonial, testate, interstate succession, and other civil liability matters in an equitable, efficient, confidential, cost-effective. So as long as there's one member or one individual from the dispute that is from the Ismali community, they qualify for this free service. They do it in an amicable and constructive manner. And in doing so, CAB services are underpinned by Islamic principles of unity, brotherhood, justice, tolerance, peace, and goodwill. So for more information on CAB, please check out the website below. So when you're looking at moving through the conflict resolution spectrum, as soon as you know conflict is present, take a look to see what would best suit the situation that you're in. Is it something you can negotiate directly with the other individual? Or do you feel because of the level of emotions, what's at stake, that you would like an impartial third party there? They're neutral to share the understanding, expectations, what you're deliverables are, and the understanding of what the end goal in the contract would be. You're going to be expected to work with the other individual on providing a resolution. So within the mediation stats, I just put a few of these in, um, and I'll say a little bit more of each. So mediation resolves most types of issues 85% of the time. Truly, in my experience, um, in 20 years of mediation, just getting the people to the table in an environment that they feel respected and can talk, really 85% will be willing to come up with some type of resolution. The other 15% are stuck in a very positional state, and it's more about showing somebody right from wrong than it is actually negotiating a resolution at the end. So the relationships preserved after using mediation uh, to resolve the conflict is 
Now, why that's important is because in workplace, in a lot of contract situations, the relationship, it doesn't have to be the best in the end, but chances are you're going to meet that person again somewhere down the road. So knowing that you have at least a level of engagement with the other individuals is going to provide you more satisfaction and also a better feeling when you end that mediation. The percentage of agreements who fulfill the agreement actions upon closing is 95% again. Why this is, is because you come up with the solution that best suits your life, that best suits your situation. So let's say I said every Monday you're to show up at 7 p.m. And every Monday you actually pick up your mom and you take her to different appointments where Tuesday would have worked better, leaving it to the participants. Guess what? They would have probably said, you know, Tuesday works for me. How much more successful are they going to be when they fit something to meet their lifestyle by showing up on the Tuesday than if I dictate you need to show up on Monday and it doesn't work within their lifestyle. So what is the mediation process? Now, every mediator can be a little bit different. This is kind of uh, the path that most mediators follow. So somebody contacts the mediator, whether it's the organization or the individuals themselves, and they do an initial inquiry. Then there's an agreement to proceed. So usually we contact the other individuals to make sure that they're willing to proceed um, with the mediation process. So we send the, the invitation to all participants to take part in the process. And then we do the pre-mediation calls with every participant. What that does is that starts to build that trusting relationship between the mediator and the participants. It gives us a general understanding if everybody's on the same page, about what needs to be resolved. And then it also gives us an opportunity to see if there's a safety issue or if there has been some past escalation uh, in a meeting that we need to be aware of because then we can set up code words, signals, or I let them know at any time they can take a break and um, we'll, I'll stop the mediation to give them a break when I see certain things happening. So it's again to develop those safety issues within a mediation. A mediation session normally um, is scheduled for three to seven hours. When I do them in person, which was 100% of the time prior to COVID, I would do full morning where we talk about what's in the past, what's happening today, and then take the afternoon to look at where do we go from here. By Zoom, it has now changed to that we only do three hours at a time. It seems a little bit more emotional draining when people are using an electronic format. And again, mediations don't just get resolved in one session or two sessions. Depending on the complexity of the conflict and how many people are involved, how deep does it go? It may take a few sessions till you actually get to the resolution portion. From there, the mediator types up a draft copy of the agreement, sends it to all the participants to make sure that it does directly reflect what they said. If it's a yes, they sign it. And then some of the groups have a follow-up. Some don't, some do. I think it's beneficial to have a follow-up just to check in what's working well, what's not working, and where do we go from here? So in preparation for a mediation, I'm not going to read through all these questions, but I've provided them because if you take a look at the structure, usually the first four questions have to do with what's going on for you. What caused you to feel that a conflict is now happening? And then at the fifth question, we kind of shift your thoughts to what could be going on for the other person? What's your goal? And then a big question at the end, what if this isn't resolved through mediation? Where do you go from there? So taking a look at all these questions 
helps every individual so that they've got a clear mind as to what are they coming in to resolve? Why did they feel offended, hurt, or the breakdown in expectations? What do they want from it? And then kind of what messaging do they want to send to the other person? So in question number four, I always say, if you missed a deadline and something happened and it was missed because of a family uh, situation, and you share that with the other individual, a lot of times there's going to be more empathy and understanding when you're looking at resolutions and designing what they look like. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. With that, I will now invite Raheem to speak on the topic of arbitration. Thanks, Marilla. And um, thanks so much to Jeanette as well for your presentation. Um, so I'll uh, take off where Jeanette left off, which is if you have a failed mediation, then what? And before I do that, I want to reiterate one point that Jeanette uh, made, which is negotiation and mediation are certainly preferable to ha having a binding dispute resolution process because you have control over the outcome. Um, you have a say in what the resolution is going to be. Um, and you can craft a resolution in a creative way. It's not just what one party asks for or the other party asks for, you know, in, in a binding dispute resolution process, arbitration included, you end up having to choose between one of two um, usually extreme positions and have very little room to craft something in the middle. Um, and with mediation, the parties have every possible option at their um, disposal if, it, if it's gonna work for them. So mediation or negotiation are certainly preferable. Um, if that fails though, there are times where the parties are unable to come to a resolution. Then you have to think about asking a third party to make the decision for you. And as a default, you go to court. Um, but maybe we can go to the second um, slide uh, and, and um, I answered the first question, which is what is arbitration? Well, arbitration is an alternative to court. It still is a binding uh, method of dispute resolution, um, but it's different in several different ways. So how is it different? What is arbitration? Well, with arbitration, instead of going to a court where you're appointed a judge and the judge decides the matter, the parties will usually have a say in who their arbitrators are, or they will designate an institution to select their arbitrators. So there are a number of different arbitral institutions and they have a roster of arbitrators that you can select from, or you can just ask them to select someone from uh, for you. They'll often take into account the type of dispute that um, is, is at issue and, and then pick someone accordingly. The parties will usually um, select a set of arbitration rules. Um, so instead of having court procedural rules, which are usually very intricate and detailed and um, and, and you almost certainly need a lawyer to help you navigate those, um, those procedural rules. Arbitration rules are much more flexible and they leave a lot more in the hands of the parties to, to, to devise a procedure that works for them in terms of number of written pleadings, for example, or whether or not there's going to be an oral hearing. Sometimes arbitrations are done just by written submissions. Um, there's a lot more flexibility in arbitration than in litigation. Um, the, what else is, does arbitration tend to look like? The parties will tend to be able to express their positions in writing. We'll, we'll still have to submit evidence in support of their uh, positions. And there is still normally an oral hearing, but it tends to be um, much shorter than in litigation. So for example, you if there are any witnesses, they tend to not give any direct evidence. There still usually is some cross-examination, um, but it's just a much shorter oral hearing uh, in most instances. Discovery, which tends to be um, what takes up a lot of time and money in litigation, 
where each side is able to seek documents from the other side. They're able to take what are called depositions of witnesses from the other side, usually, where they're able to ask a number of questions of specific witnesses in advance of the oral hearing. Usually there is no, there are no depositions in arbitration. Document discovery is, is much more limited in scope and it just doesn't take as long as it normally does in, in litigation. Um, any re, uh, arbitration award, however, is enforceable in the courts. So at the end of the day, it is still a binding dispute resolution process where you are leaving the ultimate decision of the resolution to a third party. Um, and those that third party will usually be an arbitrator, a sole arbitrator, or in some instances in, in larger disputes, usually um, three arbitrators, where one will be the president and um, each side will usually appoint um, one of the other three arbitrators. So there'll be one arbitrator that each party has um, appointed and then a chairperson, which they will have jointly appointed or the two co-arbitrators um, or party appointed arbitrators will, will, will select. So the question then is, why should you pick arbitration over litigation? I've, already, I've touched on some of this, but just to emphasize some of the advantages of arbitration over litigation, it's less prescriptive and allows for more flexibility from a procedural perspective. Um, so the process is one that the parties have more control over. As Jeanette mentioned, uh, the outcome is going to be in the hands of a third party and so the parties do not have as much control in terms of de devising or determining an outcome, but they do have much more control than litigation in devising or prescribing the process to achieve that outcome. The second thing is it's generally much more efficient in large part because um, there is less discovery, it takes less time. Um, and, and for that reason, um, off, often also costs less money. It generally allows for confidentiality. So oftentimes arbitration rules that are um, pre-selected um, are, as I mentioned, a lot of arbitral institutions will have a set of arbitration rules that can be selected by the parties. They will have confidentiality provisions oftentimes. So the dispute itself is not public. Um, information from the dispute is, is usually uh, not public and there'll be an obligation on the parties to keep it confidential. Not all arbitration rules have confidentiality provisions, but the parties, again, this goes back to the first point, which is there is a more flexibility and uh, autonomy um, in terms of the parties having control over the process can enter into a confidentiality agreement and ensure that the, the, the pleadings and the dispute itself remains confidential. In litigation, of course, matters tend to be public. Um, court proceedings tend to be open to the public um, the fact that there is litigation uh, is generally public. So confidentiality, if that's important, which it often is in business disputes, um, is something you can achieve through arbitration. And just generally, the parties have more control, including in selecting their decision maker. Um, you can have a say in who your arbitrator is. When you go to court, um, you're appointed a judge. They may have a specialty in the area of uh, the dispute that is is being handled or not. They may, you know, they may not have any expertise in the specific issue um, that is being presented for resolution. Whereas in arbitration, you can pick a specialist in a particular area. If it's a real estate dispute, you can pick someone with an expertise in, in real estate. If it's a family dispute, you can pick someone who has, um, you know, knowledge and, and experience in family disputes, um, et cetera. So there's just much more control um, uh, in the hands of the parties. And, and for cross-border disputes, um, which come up from time to time, the result of the arbitration award, the, the results of an arbitration, um, the ar arbitration award is enforceable in multiple jurisdictions through a con as a result of a convention that most states in the world have, have um, signed on to called the New York Convention. You can take an arbitration award that's been rendered in one country and you can enforce it, an international arbitration award and enforce it in another um, country. So the portability of that arbitration award um, in cross-border disputes tends to be 
a significant advantage. And we can go to the next slide. So how do you end up in arbitration as opposed to litigation? As I mentioned at the outset, the default when you have a dispute and you need to submit it for binding dispute resolution is to go to court. Um, any dispute is submitted to the courts unless the parties otherwise agree. So you, you do need an agreement between the parties to submit a dispute for binding dispute for binding arbitration. Um, and usually that comes in the form of an arbitration agreement or an arbitration clause that ends up in a contract. So if you have a contract between two parties, um, that contract sets out the substantive rights and obligations of the two parties and can also include a provision that says, if we end up in a dispute, that dispute will be submitted for resolution through arbitration. So you can have what's called an ex ante arbitration agreement. So an arbitration agreement at, up front in, an, in a contract that says, if at some point in the future we, enter, we end up in a dispute, we will submit it at that point to arbitration. But parties can also enter into an arbitration agreement once a dispute arises. So let's say they have a contract, it's silent on the issue of where a dispute will be resolved. A dispute arises and the parties come together and they say, instead of going to court, let's submit this to arbitration because you know, we want confidentiality, we want to select our decision makers and all of the other advantages that I, that I mentioned earlier. So the arbitration agreement can also be one that is entered into post dispute, post or the dispute arising. Um, so, so at any point before the submission of the dispute for resolution, you do need an arbitration agreement. That arbitration agreement is binding. Once you enter into it, you can't um, change your mind um, and you can't say, I want to go to court instead. It usually precludes you from being able to go to court. Um, but you know, often parties will, uh, will want that obviously because they wanna keep the matter confidential or they want um, you know, all the other advantages that I've outlined already. And arbitration agreements oftentimes find themselves as part of what's called a step clause or a broader dispute resolution clause. Um, if you end, in order to end up in mediation, you also need an, an agreement between the parties. So oftentimes parties will say, as Jeanette alluded to, you know, we'll have our dispute resolved through mediation and we'll try that for say two months or three months, um, or, you know, and that can be extended by the parties. But if that fails, then we'll have our dispute resolved through arbitration. And so that's called a step clause because you can, you can start with a period of you know, 10 days of negotiations, followed by formal mediation, followed by arbitration. Um, so uh, in, in that way, um, you can you know, not get to arbitration unless you absolutely have to. You go to the next slide. So an important and in, and uh, uh, development in the CAB system, in the Conciliation and Arbitration Board system that uh, Jeanette did such a great job of, of outlining, um, the, the priority and preference for the CAB system, the Smiley CAB system, is to have disputes resolved through mediation um, for all the benefits and all the reasons that Jeanette outlined. Um, it's a much better way to have your dispute resolved. But as I mentioned, sometimes mediation doesn't work out. Um, and where that happens in commercial disputes, in contract disputes and other commercial disputes um, between Jamaati members or, or involving uh, at least one Ismaili party, CAB Canada um, is going to be um, offering, starting later this year, arbitration for commercial disputes. Uh, there's a similar program in the United States uh, that's been ongoing for, for some time. Um, and CAB Canada will be rolling that same offering out um, later this year. Mediation, for the reasons we've outlined, is a prerequisite to CAB arbitration. So you have to do mediation first. Um, the dispute will be decided by three arbitrators. And we have identified several members of the Jamaat who have been trained by one of the world's leading arbitration institutions, the American Arbitration Association which is involved in dis dispute resolution around the world. Um, and so we have a number of arbitrators that have been trained by the AAA in arbitration 
um, that are available and, and will be appointed on these arbitral tribunals um, with input from the parties. Um, the parties will, and this is unique to the CAB system, normally if parties enter into an arbitration agreement and decide that to have their dispute resolved through arbitration, they will be required to pay for the arbitrator services, but through the CAB system, um, the arbitrators will be offering their assistance voluntarily. Um, and the only thing that the parties will need to pay are any out-of-pocket costs, um, which, which are generally nominal. And um, as with mediation, especially given uh, the experience over the pandemic, uh, this offering can now be um, accessed online through Zoom. So if parties are in different locations in different cities um, or the arbitrators are in different cities, um, the arbitration can actually proceed over over Zoom to increase efficiency and cost. Uh, next slide, please. And carb, CAB arbitration is unique in other ways from other arbitration, what other arbitration institutions offer. In the arbitration rules themselves, we've noted that the arbitration through CAB is meant to reflect the Ismaili ethos generally. Um, and this is a quote from the rules from the time of the Imamate of Hazrat Mawlana Ali. It has been a tradition of the Ismaili Muslims that when differences of opinions or disputes arise between them, these should be resolved by process of mediation, conciliation, and arbitration within themselves in conformity with the Islamic principles of unity, brotherhood, justice, tolerance, equity, and goodwill. Um, and so in keeping with that spirit, um, the offering will be an arbitration process that is meant to be fair, efficient, cost-effective, final and binding. And that's those are the principles that the arbitrators are meant to keep in mind uh, when arbitrating the disputes. And the rules also provide for um, the arbitral tribunal to identify and seek to identify opportunities where settlement discussions might be appropriate and to recommend and offer to the parties um, the, the option to take a pause in the arbitration to enter into settlement negotiations. Um, you know, at any point in the arbitration, the parties can request that um, CAB appoint a separate mediator to help facilitate negotiations between the parties um, if that's deemed appropriate at, at a particular stage in the arbitration proceedings. Um, and even pre-hearing, um, the arbitrators are asked to assess whether there might be an opportunity to settle the dispute or submit it to mediation before rendering an award. Um, next slide. So just briefly, the CAB arbitration process, um, as, I'm, as any arbitration requires, um, it requires a, a written agreement and, um, and it requires mediation to be first, uh, to, to occur first. If mediation fails, then one of the parties will need to commence arbitration by completing a submission form that can be um, obtained from CAB. Um, CAB will then send the parties a list of arbitrators for them to indicate their preference, and then they'll select three of them based taking into account the, the party's preferences. Um, parties will make written submissions um, on a timetable to be agreed between them and the arbitrators. Um, and unless waived by both parties, there will be an oral hearing, and both parties do have the option to be represented by lawyers if they so wish. And the final slide. Um, there is a review process for um, arbitration awards. Um, arbitration awards, just as a general matter, can be re reviewed on very limited grounds. It usually, um, those grounds usually entail procedural improprieties, so things that went wrong in the procedure. There isn't really an appeal on the substantive merits of, uh, of a dispute um, in, in the context of arbitration. It, they're meant to be final and binding awards. Um, and so ICAB, the International Conciliation and Arbitration Board, can review on limited grounds arbitration awards rendered in, um, by, by the CAB system. And um, ultimately at that point, if one of the parties does not uh, abide by the arbitration award, they can, um, either party can apply to a court to enforce the arbitration award because it is indeed um, binding on the parties. Um, so that's just a general overview of arbitration. Um, and I'll turn the floor back over to Marilla. Thank you, Rahim, for that very great presentation on arbitration. 
I'll take this opportunity now to ask both of our panelists some questions. I'll start with Jeanette. Uh, Jeanette, is mediation agreement binding in court? Certain mediation or mediated agreements are binding in courts, especially when they're court appointed mediator. You'll see this mostly in family law. So it will be um, in parenting agreements, um, custody, sometimes it has to do with the separation agreements. There's also mediators now appointed for small claims court. So all of those agreements are binding. Another, if you're doing a separation agreement, that can be attached to um, a divorce decree and it'll be submitted into the courts to be binding with what's in that. So some mediation agreements are binding, but for the majority, um, they're just between the two participants. Jeanette, who pays for the costs of mediation? So that's what's discussed right up front. Usually it's split 50-50. So if there's two different parties, that are looking at bringing in a mediator to help them resolve it, they usually agree to split it 50-50. Corporations will usually pay the whole bill if, if they're asking you to come in and work with the employees. And what happens in a situation where you have an agreement and then you realize shortly thereafter that a change needs to be made? So all mediation agreements are what I call a living document. Sometimes you agree to some great things while you're sitting there with the mediator and the other person, and then you go out and life just isn't that way. You can actually call the other person directly and ask if they would be willing to make this change, or you can go back through mediation with your newfound information. Jeanette, we've spoken about the benefits of mediation, and both Raheem and yourself mentioned that it is the preferable method of alternative dispute resolution. But what if you start the process of mediation and realize that it is not the right process to resolve your dispute? What do you suggest happens? So this is where Raheem was mentioning. Sometimes people get into it and just realize <clears throat> It's not going to be resolved through mediation. And then the next step would be arbitration. So how do they make that next step to enter into an arbitrated agreement instead? Okay, and I think that's a great way to shift into my questions for Raheem. Um, Raheem, is arbitration better suited for particular types of disputes? Um, it's a good question. Um, at least in, I, I think, Commercial disputes generally um, are well suited for arbitration. There are certain things that arbitrators can't do. They can't compel testimony from third parties. Um, and it's more difficult to enforce um, things that are not, if, if, if parties are seeking damages in terms of monetary awards, that's, that's something arbitrators can, can grant. Um, but for example, um, family disputes are much more difficult to resolve um, by private parties, if you have, for example, custody issues and things like that, where you're going to need to go to a court um, to, to get their assistance. So generally, I would say commercial disputes are well suited for resolution through um, arbitration. Okay. And similarly to the question that I asked of Jeanette, what if you start an arbitration and then you realize that it's not the right process to resolve your dispute? What, what do you generally um, recommend happen in that situation? It's a good question. And sometimes, you know, the parties can say um, that they want to pause an arbitration and enter into negotiations or a mediation midway through an arbitration. The, the caveat here, though, is unlike in mediation, you need both parties agreement to move to some other form of dispute resolution. Um, otherwise, the arbitration agreement is binding. And both parties, unless they agree, must continue through the process until the end um, of the arbitration process. So unless both parties agree, um, they're stuck in that process. 
So then what would happen if parties enter into an arbitration agreement and if one of the party does not abide by that arbitration agreement? It's a, it's a very good question. Um, one of them can go to the court. And so, for example, if a party goes to court instead of, an ar- instead of arbitration where they have an arbitration agreement, the other party can compel arbitration by going to the court and saying, we have an arbitration agreement. This dispute should be submitted to arbitration instead. And the court will then refer the matter to arbitration. If one party just refuses to participate in the arbitration, then the arbitration will proceed without them. Um, And you can get a default arbitration award against you, just like you can get a default judgment against you in court. So say the parties enter into an arbitration agreement and they commence the arbitration and an award is issued by the arbitrator. What if a party does not abide by an arbitration award? What happens in that scenario? Um, In that scenario, you take the arbitration award and you then go to the court where um, you can seek the assistance of the court to enforce that arbitration award. So that arbitration award can effectively be converted to a judgment of that court and then can be enforced just like any other judgment. So uh, the court could then assist you in, for example, if there was a damages award that wasn't being paid. Um, to help enforce that award against the third party, um, the third party's assets, for example. So um, it is an enforceable award um, and can be set aside on very limited procedural grounds, but um, ultimately then it gets converted to a judgment and is enforceable just like any court judgment. We often consider alternative uh, dispute resolution such as arbitration to be um, less costly than litigation. Is arbitration a cheaper alternative to litigation? Generally speaking, yes. And in particular, because um, of the discovery disputes um, being much more narrow in scope. That being said, there, you know, some of the largest disputes in the world um, for because of the other advantages, parties agreed to have them decided through arbitration. And in those cases, um, you end up having uh, substantial legal teams on both sides and and, um, you you use that same mechanism with party flexibility and all the rest, Um, but they can be rather extensive disputes and can be quite costly. But for the most part, especially for smaller disputes and certainly the CAB arbitration offering, which will be available later this year, the intention is to make it much more efficient, streamlined and cost effective. Thank you so much for answering those questions, Raheem, and thank you, Jeanette, for answering uh, my questions. I'll take this opportunity to ask Jeanette for any closing remarks she may have. So I would just like to say using the ADR, the less informal, keep the control in your hands. Just be curious what's going on for the other person. Um, What is it that didn't happen for them? And it just helps us shift from staying positional with us. And it makes for a way better resolution and negotiation. So using ADR at the lowest level, that's always the most beneficial control time and cost wise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeanette. And Raheem, I'll ask the same of you. Do you have any closing remarks? Um, Jeanette put it really well. I I, um, would echo what she says. in terms of uh, you know parties keeping control, parties um, trying to be creative with their dispute um, resolution um, processes and approaches, but also in terms of the substantive resolution of their dispute, putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Um, you know, conflict is a very difficult thing to um, to deal with, and when parties come to the cab system or a third party to help them resolve their conflicts. Um, you know, the CAB system certainly approaches these conflicts as um, disputes that they're trying to help the parties come to a resolution that they can both live with. And ultimately, um, to, to reach that end, the parties themselves need, as Jeanette said, to put themselves in the shoes of the other, the other party and to try and be creative about um, the type of resolution that might satisfy them, but also the other party. 
Um, but you know where that's where that's just not possible, and there is uh, a stalemate. Um, arbitration is a, a, usually a better option to litigation um, because it, it's more cost effective. It's it can be confidential. You can have a say in in who your decision maker is, and um, you know it, it keeps things more efficient. Discovery ends up taking up can take up months, if not years, of time. And um, to have that sort of emotional burden on you for such a long period of time is, is both stressful and, and something that obviously we, we, we would want to avoid and arbitration certainly helps um, to do that. But I, I will echo what Jeanette says. Ideally, parties are able to come together and with the help oftentimes of a third party can identify solutions that are creative and that help both parties achieve um, at least some type of a solution that they can all uh, live with. Thank you, Jeanette, and thank you, Raheem, for that. And thank you for joining us for today's discussion. This session has been recorded and the webinar will be available at iicanada.org. The fourth webinar in this series on the psychology of contracts will be presented on Thursday, October 21st, and is titled Dynamics of Family Businesses. As stated previously, throughout its history, the Shia Ismaili Muslim community has maintained a tradition of resolving disputes and differences through a voluntary process of mediation, conciliation, and arbitration. In 1986, His Highness the Aga Khan established a global institutional framework of conciliation and arbitration boards, also referred to as CABs, to provide dispute resolution services for Ismailis at the regional, national, and international level. Currently, the CAB system consists of 19 national conciliation and arbitration boards, also referred to as NCABs, that operate in the following jurisdictions. Afghanistan, Australia and New Zealand, Canada, Democratic Republic of Congo, France, India, Iran, Kenya, Madagascar, Mozambique, Pakistan, Portugal, Syria, Tajikistan, Tanzania, Uganda, United Arab Emirates, United Kingdom, and the United States of America. The International Conciliation and Arbitration Board, also referred to as ICAB, handles complex international cross-border cases and appeals and also coordinates the global CAB system by developing policies and programs and identifying and sharing best practices across the CAB system. ICAB is also responsible for coordinating and delivering training to the 700 plus volunteers, CAB mediators around the world. The mandate of CAB, as previously stated, is to assist the parties with differences or disputes arising from commercial, matrimonial, testate and intestate succession, and other civil liability matters in an equitable, efficient, confidential, cost-effective, amicable, and constructive manner. In doing so, CAB services are underpinned by the Islamic principles of unity, brotherhood, justice, tolerance, peace, and goodwill. CAB's core values are to maintain confidentiality, to act with fairness and neutrality, to provide excellent service, to demonstrate compassion and commitment, to be culturally sensitive, and to comply with applicable laws and ethics of our faith. In closing, Prince Amin Aga Khan, in his address to the Ismaili Economic Forum in Dubai, clearly articulated that the Jamaat has traditionally been intelligent and well-educated. Equally, members of the Jamaat have traditionally valued their independence and been reticent indeed about giving up their freedom. A partnership or an alliance, however, can only really be successful if it is characterized by good faith among all parties and by a consistent transparency from the creation of the alliance through the everyday operations of the business. And partners should not be afraid of putting in writing these basic underlying foundations of their partnership so that from the very beginning, everything is absolutely clear. Thank you again to our presenters for their time and insight on this subject. And thank you all for participating in today's session.